Hi, now this is a bit of a follow on from my mailbag uh, segment. Decided to make this as a separate video. We're actually using a uh, pulse generator here from Manute. Thank you very much, Manute, who uh, sent me this and I'll provide uh, links to uh, his uh, uh, schematic and uh, design and things like that. But he sent that's powered from a 1.5 volt battery. So see the mailbag uh, segment for that one. And uh, but I just decided that we'd uh, do a separate video here of using a uh, pulse generator and uh, see what the bandwidth of my uh, Agilent MSOX 3054A oscilloscope is. It claims it's 500 megahertz analog bandwidth. That'll be um, nominally, uh, of course, the bandwidth of an oscilloscope is minus 3 dB down at that frequency. So the frequency is not actually, you know, it doesn't give you a flat response to 500 megahertz. Should be 3 dB down, but using one of these pulse generators, we can actually calculate the real bandwidth. Now I've got a little uh, Dave Cad note here to explain the rise time versus the bandwidth. Now the rise, uh, th there's actually a direct relationship between the rise time you see on the oscilloscope, assuming a perfect input, um, you know, a pulse which has a perfect input, and the actual analog bandwidth of the scope. And for traditional Gaussian response scopes, they're your old, uh, like, you know, your basic analog uh, CRT oscilloscopes, these non-digital types. It uses the classic formula, the rise time is equal to 0.35 on the bandwidth of the scope. It's as simple as that. But uh, these more modern scopes, uh, digital scopes, don't necessarily use a, have a Gaussian response on their analog input channels. They'll have what's called a maximally flat response, but even that will depend on you know, what kind of roll-off they're actually using on the, the filtering of the analog uh, front end. So uh, basically, it's, you know, it's a little bit higher general, but it's roughly around about 0.4 on the bandwidth. So slightly different variations, but assuming that we've got one of these, which generates an absolutely perfect pulse with zero rise time, like zero femtoseconds rise time. Well, zero seconds or zero femtoseconds, same thing. But assuming it's absolutely perfect, then uh, this formula will apply. We can, if we know the rise, if we, we can measure the rise time on the oscilloscope, we can calculate the bandwidth. And it's not necessarily that same 500 megahertz quoted. It's usually better than that. But of course, these pulse generators never give you a perfect rise time. Um, this one at best is going to be probably, you know, 350 picoseconds, 300, 400 picoseconds, or uh, something like that. It's not perfect. So it is actually going to have, contribute, it's going to have an effect on and contribute to the rise time you see on the oscilloscope here. But as a rough rule of thumb, if it's five times better than what you need, then it's not really going to affect it much. Now, in the case of this 500 megahertz, uh, uh, bandwidth using the formula of 0.4, we can calculate the uh, rise time in theory of this oscilloscope is going to be uh, 0.4 divided by 500 megahertz. That's 800 picoseconds. So this one, although we don't actually know, uh, we do, you know we haven't actually measured the r absolute rise time of this thing, so we don't know what it is. But we know it's going to be in the order of you know 300 picoseconds or thereabouts. It's you know, it's only like three times, just on maybe three times as good as the oscilloscope. So it's, it's yeah, it may, you know, it's going to contribute a little bit. Ideally, you're going to want five times better, but this will certainly do the job for most bandwidth, most oscilloscopes up to say, you know, 500 megahertz bandwidth. And of course, to measure the true performance of this thing, we need a really high end sampling scope, you know, the type that you mortgage your house for, you know, $50,000, $100,000 scope, something like that, that has, you know, 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz bandwidth, something like that. We need something really good so that the bandwidth of the oscilloscope, um, you know, is basically so high, it doesn't matter. We're me measuring the true performance of the rise and fall time of this thing. So I'm going to have to try and get access to a better scope for that to actually measure this circuit here. But Anyway, we can figure out from this what uh, actual bandwidth we're getting on the scope. And I bet you it's better than 500 megahertz. And as you can see, this uh, pulse generator is pretty good. The rise and fall times are essentially identical. 520 picoseconds, 530 picoseconds. 
And of course, we can simply uh, swap these two terms, the rise time and the bandwidth here, uh, to uh, because if we know we're measuring our rise time, we can calculate the bandwidth. So if we go 0.4 divided by our rise time of 520 picoseconds here, that gives us about 769 megahertz. So there you go. The bandwidth of this scope is at least um, as good as that because you know we've got uh, things like the uh, you know we've got the coax a meter of coax cable on the uh, end of this thing which is you know it might contribute a little something and uh, and of course we've got the uh, contribution of the uh, unknown rise time of this thing but we can say it's at least that good it's much better than uh, what you would think at minus 3 dB down at 500 megahertz so this thing's pretty much kicking ass and just in case you're wondering what the other channels are I've chosen channel 3 here and we're basically getting identical 520 530 picoseconds and you can see that uh, our signal integrity is not perfect here we have a little bit of a little dip there just before it starts and of course some undershoot and ringing at the end of it here ideally it should be better than that that's probably due to our coax cable it would have been nicer if we had a direct connection or if this connector here um, wasn't this um, uh, socket type but was actually a plug type we could plug that directly into the BNC on the front of our scope here that would have been the ideal case to uh, you know because we're using a meter of RG59 uh, cable here so that's probably causing um, you know that that sort of uh, ringing there in the waveform. I doubt it would be uh, the layout because the layout is taken. He's really stitched the uh, the uh, front and the back uh, ground planes together really nice. So you know I'm sure it's really nice short pass there directly from the uh, transistor there, and it's working quite nice. So I think it's mostly the coax doing that. But check out this interesting. Uh, phenomenon if I touch the can here it disappears look at that it just absolutely vanishes let's turn the uh, let's turn the averaging off there and so we're getting all of our signals there we're getting our jitter that gets wider as as it goes out it's quite a bit of jitter in that signal but as you can see if I put my finger on that it slightly gets wider gets a little bit bigger as you as I'm not quite touching that and you can see it start to expand there as the ca capacitive coupling between my finger and that can really kicks in but I can just completely kill that so that's the 50 Hertz obviously pick up um, from my from my body there just absolutely swamping that uh, oscillator circuit and the avalanche uh, breakdown of this uh, transistor in here so really you know that's that's absolutely killing that ideally you want this thing in a proper shielded box. But hey, even with a bare board like this, with no shield at all, using a big meter long, uh, you know, crusty bit of coax cable, you can at least get, you know, a decent measurement on the bandwidth of your scope. I like it. I highly recommend you build one of these suckers up. They're very handy. And as it so happens, I'll be getting this scope upgraded to the one gigahertz bandwidth model um, in the not too distant future. So I'll take this along with me uh, down to Melbourne, going down there to get the scope upgraded, and uh, we'll be able to check the performance before and after. And here's before, 630 picoseconds. And uh, of course, we've only got one nanosecond maximum uh, time base there. That's the fastest time base we've got. The one gigahertz version should go a bit quicker than that. But it'll be interesting to see um, what we get on the one gigahertz version. So thanks to Minute for uh, this little board. That's excellent, brilliant. Saves me having to build my own. I was gonna build up that classic Jim Williams uh, circuit as many people have, and I highly recommend you do it. It's good fun, and you can learn all about the avalanche behavior of uh, transistor, um, avalanche breakdown, it's terrific. And get a very handy, extremely fast rise and fall time pulse generator, and as you can see, it's you know one, two, three, four, five, six, almost seven volts. Uh, you know, six and a half volt uh, pulse there at, you know, at least uh, 530 picoseconds. It's likely a lot better than that. So pretty neat. Now let's take a look at the application note from Linear Technology AN47. Classic application note. It's massive. Written by uh, the late, great Jim Williams, of course. Very famous app note. It's got a lot more in it than just this uh, pulse generator circuit. So I highly recommend that you uh, 
have some bedtime reading here, AN47, classic. Anyway, um, this is a circuit designed for measuring the uh, probe oscilloscope uh, response. It's a classic circuit. Um, a few people have done something better using like garden variety uh, parts, but figure D1 is the one we want, which is the circuit that uh, Manute used here, and it basically provides a one nanosecond pulse with rise and fall times of approximately 350 picoseconds, but they're going to depend upon the uh, uh, selection, the specific hand selection of the uh, transistor, the avalanche transistor that we're uh, using to generate this pulse. And here's the circuit here, and it basically uh, just a single cell converter to generate for, uh, the 90 volts required to uh, break down, avalanche break down, the transistor, which is a 2N23 uh,69 and that's the exact same transistor that Manute is using here and it's got the uh, metal T05 uh, package of course uh, it still comes in that but uh, you really have to uh, hand select this and it says C text there for a reason so let's go up and take a look at that and here it is Q1 may require selection to get avalanche behavior such behavior while characteristic of the device specified is not guaranteed by the manufacturer sample of 50 Motorola uh, 2N2369 spread over a 12-year date code span yielded an 82% result. So some of them aren't even going to work at all, presumably. But uh, this one does. It's been hand-selected by Minute. I'm sure he's uh, tested it to make sure it works before he sent it to me. And uh, and they Jim Wuens claims all the good devices switched in less than 650 picoseconds. So... Um, our one is clearly getting better than that because it's at least uh, 500 and uh, something. But, uh, you know, I think it's probably going to be around that, you know, rough 350 picosecond figure uh, wouldn't surprise me because you have to combine that 350 picoseconds with the uh, rise time of the oscilloscope and stuff like that. But I think we need access to a better scope to measure this thing. And here's the result that uh, Jim Williams got. And as you can see, ba the construction of his is basically, you know, he's got it in a metal box like this, just a rat's nest construction like that. It looks messy, but that's, you know, the absolute lowest, um, you know, impede lowest inductance sort of uh, build you can get. And, of course, uses a uh, plug directly on here, which plugs directly in the oscilloscope, so there's no coax cable at all it, it works a treat and that's of course why he's getting no very little ringing there's a little bit of ringing at the tail end there but it's tiny as opposed to uh the one which me we measured which is probably due to the uh, long coax used on that thing because that's going to have some inductance sure it's working like a transmission line but it can only go so far so uh really you need the utmost in signal integrity so if you're going to build one of these things not only do you need to shield it as you saw the 50 hertz just uh swamp the thing and of course, he's even got the battery box uh, shield here. Do not drop me. Do not drop me. And there you go. I love it. So that's a classic build from Jim Williams. And of course, this is a very elegant circuit. As you can see, it's effectively just a high voltage source. It's effectively only uh, four parts, pretty much. There's three resistors in here and one well, uh, sorry, five parts, uh, three resistors, a, a capacitor and transistor. And that forms an avalanche breakdown uh, pulse generator or an, or an oscillator um, that is, you know, the breakdowns determined on the individual transistor and the component values. And uh, let's have a look at how uh, Jim Williams explains it. The regulator's 90 volt output is applied to Q1 via the 1 meg 2 picofarad combination. Q1 is a 40 volt breakdown device for the 2N2369, so it breaks down at 40 volts. And then if you go above that, it non destructively avalanches when C1 charges to a high enough voltage. So it, you apply 90 volts here, it charges up via the 1 meg, and then it breaks down because, of course, the base here is tied to ground. So there's nothing driving uh, the base of this transistor. So this transistor is switched off. It's effectively, you know, it's switched off not doing anything, but once it reaches that maximum breakdown voltage, roughly 40 volts for this device, bang, then it avalanches. The result is a quickly rising, very fast pulse across the 50 ohm output. That's why you have to terminate it in 50 ohms on your oscilloscope as well. And then, of course, uh, there we go. C1 discharges, Q1's collector voltage falls, and the breakdown ceases, and bingo, C1 charges back up, and 
it free runs at about uh, 200 kilohertz and there's the figure that shows the output pulse which is pretty much exactly what we've got with a little bit more uh, ringing on the output but apart from that it's a very elegant very simple circuit and that's a Jim Williams classic and as always if you want to discuss this video jump on over to the EEV blog forum where there'll be a special thread to discuss this particular one and uh, this Jim Williams circuit and if you like the video please give it a big thumbs up catch you next time